Please have a seat. We are going to start this uh, last plenary session, our conference. Uh, welcome to everyone um, to this uh, plenary uh, titled Compassion Leadership for Transforming uh, Healthcare. Um, healthcare systems uh, around the world are facing really incredible challenges uh, and uh, healthcare managers need to face, I think, uh, an unprecedented scenario. Uh, uncertainty, I think, is the only certain thing that managers will need to face in the future. Um, geopolitical tensions, uh, global warming, uh, and uh, its socio-economic consequences, and also consequences for health, pandemics. Digital disruption, you know, digital transformation is also bringing uh, digital disruption, uh, and uh, this uh, is generating uh, really a highly challenging uh, environment. Healthcare organizations uh, uh, need to be changed, transformed, uh, um, and uh, they probably should change their shape. They need to be more agile, uh, and this will require, for sure, um, a, a positive attitude of the people to, to change. We need to question uh, uh, which leadership styles uh, are appropriate uh, in this uh, new scenario. And a wealth of research uh, uh, evidence now guides uh, managers towards uh, uh, the key areas uh, uh, for their roles uh, in uh, transforming uh, for the future. Compassionate and collective leadership and cultures in health services uh, uh, meeting the core needs of staff, uh, developing strong team and cross-boundary working, uh, and self-compassion. These are the characteristics uh, uh, that are outlined by a, a great researcher uh, that uh, is today with us. Uh, Professor Michael West, uh, that is uh, the moment visiting fellow at the King's Fund is professor of work and organizational psychology at uh, Lancaster University, visiting professor at the University College of Dublin, uh, emeritus professor at Ashton University of the United Kingdom. Uh, for us, it's really a great pleasure uh, to have Professor West uh, here. Uh, to introduce uh, the, the, the topic, uh, introduce the uh, discussion that will see uh, really three distinguished scholars to, to uh, discuss the, the presentation. Uh, uh, Lucy Nugent, that is uh, Chief Executive Officer uh, Tallow at the University Hospital, Professor Walter Ricciardi, Professor at the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore, and President of the uh, Cancer Mission Board of uh, the European Commission, and uh, Miklos Szotka, Director of Health Service Management Training Center at Semmelweis University in Hungary. Um, Professor West, we are eager to hear from you. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Americo, for the really warm and generous introduction. I'm really, that's so kind. And thank you also to Emma and to my wonderful friend and colleague, Sandra Butigied, for inviting me here and giving me the privilege of being able to speak with you this afternoon. As Americo said, most of our healthcare systems are facing the biggest crisis that they faced in at least the last 75 years. And at the heart of that crisis is a workforce crisis. Huge numbers of vacancies, particularly in certain occupations, midwifery, accident and emergency. Huge numbers of vacancies in social care, which are affecting our healthcare systems. 
we see increasing levels of staff stress amongst those who deliver healthcare. And those increases in staff stress are not simply a result of the pandemic. Those levels of stress have been rising across our nations for at least the last seven, eight, nine, ten years. For example, in the United Kingdom, around one in two staff report that they've been unwell as a result of work stress in the previous year. And we see on the Copenhagen burnout inventory, which we apply in our staff surveys, that one in three staff, or more than one in three staff, report being burned out at work, either often or all of the time. And that has huge consequences both for the personal health of staff as well as for safe patient care. Chronic stress, burnout, is associated with staff cardiovascular disease, addictions, alcoholism, cancers, diabetes, depression, and family breakup. And we also know that those levels of stress are associated with much less safe patient care. Doctors who report those levels of stress at one point in time or those levels of burnout are between 43 and 62% more likely to make a major medical error in the next month. We see similar data among surgeons and nurses working in intensive care units. We also see huge inequities in health care outcomes across our systems. Here in Italy, between the north and south of Italy, in the United Kingdom, in Scotland, if you compare the richest and the poorest areas, there's an average gap in, li in longevity life expectancy of 24 years. So 48 years of age for the poorest areas and 72 for the richest areas. This is unsustainable in society. And we see those levels of inequality within our healthcare systems also. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, of all of those healthcare staff who tragically lost their lives during the pandemic, fully 63% were from minority ethnic group backgrounds, whereas only 21% of staff overall are from minority ethnic group backgrounds. What we also see is, of course, the huge and increasing demands on our healthcare services. And there is, as Americo said, a fundamental need to transform the way that we look after the health, the happiness, the well being of our populations that will require us to work effectively across boundaries between primary healthcare, secondary healthcare, social care, with local councils, with education, with housing, with employment with voluntary agencies, with communities, and with families and patients and service users themselves. So that rather bleak assessment, I think, implies four really key leadership priorities for the future. The first is that we have to make workforce the priority. And compassionate leadership, for reasons I'll explain in the moment and that Americo has, has referred to, is at the heart of that response. Second, we have to address these issues of equity and diversity and inclusion, not only within our society in terms of healthcare, but also within our healthcare organizations. If we're to utilize the diversity of skills and knowledge and competencies of our workforce, if we're to ensure that everybody's motivation is at the highest possible level, we have to address the issue of staff stress. And this is beyond offering mindfulness and apps and advice on yoga and diet to people. It's much more fundamental than that. And we have to create more collective leadership. We know from research around the world that hierarchical systems with a focus on targets is about the worst kind of culture for achieving the healthcare outcomes we want to achieve for patients. So we have to create more collective leadership. How do we proceed practically? We've been through the most extraordinary three years, and what we can learn from that last three years, I think, is the lesson of compassion. The compassion that healthcare staff across Europe courageously showed for patients with COVID, the compassion that staff showed to each other, and the compassion that our society showed. Walter and I were just talking about how the response of people across our nations was virtually always compassion. It was only small groups of people that didn't accede to the limitations that we placed upon them. And that's typical of what you see of human behavior in disasters. There's just a huge upwelling of compassion. 
What does it mean, this word? Paul Gilbert, who I think is the real guru of compassion, defines it as a sensitivity to suffering in self and others with a commitment to prevent or alleviate it. In practice, I think it has four key behavioral elements. So if my wonderful friend Sandra here was in pain or distress or upset, then for me to be compassionate to you, I have to do four things. I have to attend, understand, empathize, and help. And attending means both being present with you in the here and now, effortlessly being present with you, letting go of all of the other stuff, just being present with you, and giving my attention. Nancy Klein talks about listening with fascination. And that provides a really powerful platform for the second element of compassion, which is seeking to understand your pain or distress, ideally through us having a dialogue. That in turn enables me to empathize with you, feeling your pain or distress, but having the presence not to make it my drama. And that in turn provides the motivation for the fourth critical element of compassion, which is helping you or serving you in some way. And we know that from neuroscience studies over the last 20 years that there's a fundamental difference between empathy alone and compassion. So when we ask people to be empathic to another in pain or distress, that's associated with the activation of various pain centers in the brain. But when we ask people to be compassionate with that additional intent to help component, that's associated with the activation of the reward center in the brain. Why? Because we've been hardwired by evolution to be compassionate to others in pain or distress. It's the basis for forming social groups, tribes, communities. Compassion is about blurring the boundaries between self and other. It's fundamentally connecting with each other. It establishes a feeling of belonging. And belonging is fundamental in human behavior. We're as likely to die from the effects of loneliness as we are from the effects of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And we know a lot more now about the role of compassion in healthcare generally from lots, hundreds of randomized control trials and meta-analysis. And I want to show you a few examples. The first is randomized control trial of anesthetists visiting patients prior to surgery. In one arm of the intervention, they do a normal visit, provide sedatives, and in the other arm of the intervention, they don't provide sedatives, but they're briefed to be extra compassionate. And the compassion intervention is associated with patients having a much lower requirement for painkillers post-surgically in a much shorter length of hospital stay. The second is randomized control trials here in Italy and North America of patients with an early diagnosis of lung cancer, randomly assigned either to normal early cancer care or to normal early cancer care plus early palliative care, so if you like, an extra early dose of compassion. It was a study of quality of life. Yes, quality of life was much better for the palliative care condition patients, but what was an unexpected finding was that those patients also lived significantly longer. And we see similar large effects of clinician compassion in the treatment of long-term disorders like HIV and diabetes, and of therapist compassion in the treatment of mental health problems. The majority of nurses and doctors say, and allied health professionals say, well, that's fine, but we just don't have time. But actually what the research tells us is that compassion doesn't take any more time. It's less about doing something additional and rather it's about being even more attentive, understanding, empathizing and helping. If you ask patients what they want from those who provide care for them, they say, I want somebody who will be present, who will listen to me, who will understand my difficulties, who will care for me and then who will try to help me. It's the same. Suffice to say, oh, and by the way, in randomized control trials with doctors, GPs, and nurses who are briefed to be extra compassionate in their interactions with patients over a two-week period, we see, consistent with the neuroscience studies that I described earlier, that they experience significant improvements in their own mental health, lower levels of anxiety, stress, and depression, which is hugely important given what I said at the beginning. Compassion is the most important intervention we have available to us in healthcare. So the challenge for us as managers 
is how do we create the conditions within our organisations, within our healthcare systems, nationally, regionally, where staff will be even more compassionate to patients, and even more compassionate to each other, and even more self-compassionate, because those things go together. And the answer to that question is, as you know, well, that's about the culture of our organisations. How do we shape culture? Every interaction by every one of us every day is an opportunity to shape the culture of our organisations through how warm, kind, irritable, cynical, aggressive, compassionate we are, the emotional and behavioural ripples we know radiate out and get replicated. But the role of leaders we know from the last hundred years of research and organisational culture internationally, the role of leaders is particularly powerful because what leaders focus on and talk about and pay attention to, and particularly what they portray in their own behaviour, tells us what they value. Whatever it says about values on the website, this is how we read the values of our organisation. So to create compassionate cultures, healthcare managers, leaders, must embody compassion in, in our leadership. And that means leaders having the courage to be present with those that we lead, to listen with fascination. We only have 60% of the staff on the ward that we need to deliver safe patient care. Leaders who have the courage to seek to understand the challenges that staff face, not simply imposing some understanding from an elevated, hierarchical, remote position. Leaders having the courage to feel with those they lead, to feel what it's like to be a nurse on your third 13-hour night shift in a row, not having had time to take your rest break, feeling really upset that you've not delivered the quality of care to that dying elderly lady because you were so overworked and feeling so exhausted you're afraid to drive home in case you have a serious accident. And leaders who have the courage to help those they lead. And in the context of leadership, that means helping those we lead to do their jobs more effectively by helping to remove the obstacles and by helping to ensure that they have the resources they need. The right numbers of staff, the right equipment that works, the right training. And I'm not describing some new model of leadership to you here. We've known for 60 or 70 years from leadership research internationally that these four behaviours are basic to effective leadership. The most important skill of a leader is listening to those we lead. And the most important task of a leader is helping those we lead to do their jobs more effectively. I had the privilege back in 2003 of leading the design and the implementation of the first national staff survey for the NHS in England. Sandra, you'll remember the work that we did um, and with my a, a, a wonderful team and particularly um, Jeremy Dawson and Sandra was very involved in all of that work. That survey has run, evidence-based, academically-based survey has run every year for the last 20 years with over 600,000 people completing it every year. It's the most extraordinary data set. And what it tells us is in health service organizations where staff generally report that their leaders behave in these four ways, in those organizations subsequently what we see is higher levels of staff engagement which predicts higher levels of patient satisfaction, better care quality, better financial performance, and lower avoidable patient mortality where staff generally report their leaders don't behave in those four ways. Subsequently, in those organizations, you see staff reporting higher levels of chronic work overload, staff stress, patients report not being treated with the dignity, respect, care, compassion they wish for, care quality is worse, financial performance is worse, avoidable patient mortality is significantly higher. So for all of these reasons, compassionate leadership is core to transforming our healthcare organizations and systems for a sustainable future. This is not some soft cushions, scented candles approach to leadership. It requires much more courage and authenticity to lead compassionately than to lead top down. It's about being effective as leaders, inclusive, collective, and working across boundaries. 
You know when you have effective leadership in a national system, a regional system, an organization, or a team, or a ward, or a department, when there is direction, alignment, and commitment. Direction means a, a clear vision of what we're here to, to, to achieve, translated into four or five strategic goals, not 45. Clear, agreed, challenging goals at every level of organizations. That's what the research tells us. And then alignment means ensuring people's efforts are aligned around that purpose, not being wasted on unnecessary bureaucracy or petty interdepartmental conflicts. And it's creating trust and motivation. And if leadership is not inclusive, then by definition it's not compassionate. We all have favorites when we lead, but the more we exhibit that favoritism, the worse we are as leaders. And we should particularly ensure that our inclusiveness as a leader extends to those who are in some way other from us, different professional groups, people from different demographic backgrounds, from different nations. It means attending, understanding, empathizing, and helping at least equally with everybody, and particularly more with those who've been systematically disadvantaged. All of the research that we've done since the 1980s on healthcare teams, whether executive teams, breast cancer care teams, primary health teams, tells us that teams that are, have direction, alignment, and commitment that are more diverse are far more productive and innovative than, more, than teams made up of more similar people. Because there's a greater wealth of knowledge and skills and abilities to draw on to inform our functioning. And compassionate leadership is about helping everybody feel they have leadership responsibility. After all, quality and safety is everyone's responsibility in healthcare. We have the largest, most skilled, most motivated workforce in the whole of industry, yet we continue to manage people largely through command and control. It's absurd. The most effective organizations in the world usually have no more than three or four reporting levels. It's estimated for every reporting level you add, you add about 10% to bureaucracy. In the English healthcare system and most of the healthcare systems that I see in Europe, reporting levels are in double figures in hospitals. It doesn't make sense. We have to create more collective leadership through building more effective team-based team working. Only in our system, only 40% of staff, although virtually all staff say they work in teams, only 40% say they work in teams that have clear goals and that meet regularly to review their performance. The very basics of team working. The more people who work in real teams, as we call them, the better is care quality, staff stress is dramatically lower, patient satisfaction, staff retention, avoidable patient mortality, and so on. And every team in our organizations, every department should have as one of its four or five goals, improving the effectiveness with which we work with other teams or departments. Compassionate leadership is about how we work across boundaries, not just within our areas. Always asking the question of other teams, departments, organizations, sectors. How can we help you so that together we deliver more effectively for the communities we serve? This is about the culture of our organizations, and our research has demonstrated six key cultural elements characteristic of high-performing organizations. I'm not gonna go through them, but there's a website where we've developed a program, an open source free online program to support organizations to transform their cultures in these ways. And the evaluations of the program have produced really strong indicators of positive outcomes. What about this problem of staff stress in terms of a sustainable future? Most organizations we see focus their efforts of st on staff stress by using what we call tertiary and secondary interventions, treating the resulting ill health or trying to help staff become more resilient through things, as I said, like mindfulness programs. But the evidence tells us that the most effective interventions are primary interventions, which focus on transforming the health, the workforce, the workplace conditions that create stress in the, in the first place. Work overload, poor supervision, poor team working, uh, interpersonal or interdepartmental conflict. 
I'm not saying we shouldn't be using tertiary and secondary interventions, but if we're not focused primarily on those workplace characteristic interventions, we're simply treating symptoms, not addressing the underlying causes. And the underlying causes are our failure to meet the core human needs of staff. Why are staff getting more and more stressed? Because we are increasingly failing at meeting their core needs. And staff, us, all of us humans, have three core needs in life and in the workplace. We have a need to feel autonomy and control, a need to feel like we belong, that we're valued and respected and cared for in our teams and organizations, and a need to feel effective, to feel competent. Autonomy and control means having voice and influence. Nottingham University Hospitals has 95 nurse councils that have six hours a, a month to meet to influence strategy and decision making. It's about working in climates of justice and fairness rather than fear and blame. Mersey Care has eliminated 85% of disciplinary investigations and 95% of suspensions in the context of its, what they call, restorative just culture. It's about giving people good working conditions, proper rest braces, spaces, equipment that works, control and influence over shifts and rotors. Many places have introduced self-rostering or annualized hours. And belonging is primarily conferred by the teams we work in. And as I indicated, there's a huge amount of work we can do to improve team working in our healthcare organizations and into team working. And many organizations are pursuing strategies in that direction with really positive consequences. And it's about creating compassionate cultures. Um, Berkshire Health, a mental health and learning disability organization, has retrained all its staff over the last five years in compassionate leadership. They now have the lowest levels of staff stress and the highest levels of engagement of any mental health or learning disability trust in the United Kingdom. Wales has a 10-year strategy for implementing compassionate leadership across the whole of health and social care over the next 10 years. And they're increasingly including the government. I spoke to 600 of the most senior civil servants earlier this year about the development of compassionate leadership. In Ireland, um, the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland now has compassionate leadership as part of its training at undergraduate and postgraduate levels for all medical and nursing uh, students. And work contribution is primarily prevented by chronic work overload. It's the number one factor in staff stress and the number one reason why staff quit. Yet, increasingly, I think, healthcare managers and leaders are reluctant to talk about chronic excessive workload because I think they feel distressed by their inability to deal with the problem of inadequate numbers of staff and too many targets from top-down governmental bodies. But the role of leaders is not necessarily to have solutions to problems. The role of leaders is to ensure that we're bringing our attention collectively to bear on the most difficult issues we face. And workload is definitely it. Some organizations are, we've heard this morning about using new technologies, building more effective interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary team working affects workload. East London Foundation Trust regularly asks its staff what activities they would reduce or get rid of. They've eliminated 85% of clinical audit activities in the context of their quality improvement culture. They're rated outstanding in terms of care quality. But ultimately, we have to work across boundaries to focus on preventative care. Working across, bless you, working across health, health and social care and with local councils, education, housing, employment, and communities and voluntary associations, as I said. Compassionate leadership is about recognizing that it's people who make up our healthcare organizations and meeting their core needs is critical to our ability to sustain our organizations for the future. It's also about everybody in our organizations leading for compassionate teamwork. We're all responsible for how we behave. And compassion is about courage, the courage to, or for all of us to challenge corrosive politics, toxic interactions, poor performance, because ultimately we're here to serve the patients and the communities in our, across our nations. 
I had the privilege during the pandemic of writing a book on compassionate leadership and bringing together all of the research evidence and case examples. I only had room in my suitcase for one free copy. So um, I hope there'll be a bit of a melee at the end where a number of you want to get it, but whoever gets here first. The final chapter is on self-compassion, which I think is the most important lesson I can leave you with. Because what we now know from the research evidence is that our ability to be compassionate as healthcare professionals, as leaders, as managers, is vitally dependent on our preparedness and courage to be self-compassionate, to look after ourselves. And looking after ourselves means attending, understanding, empathizing and helping, being present with ourselves, knowing when I'm feeling overwhelmed, afraid, ashamed, angry, irritable, and accepting those feelings. And then bringing a nurturing, caring attitude towards myself, just as I would care for Sandra if you were in pain, why would I not also turn that caring on myself when I'm in pain? And the evidence now is really clear that as leaders, as healthcare professionals, self-compassion is essential for our ability to lead compassionately and it has a knock-on effect in her terms of how compassionately those we lead behave towards those we provide care for. When we have the courage to connect deeply and authentically with ourselves and with our being and with the core values that give our lives meaning, it enables us to connect more deeply and authentically with all of those we provide care for and all of those we lead and indeed all of those we interact with in our lives. So all of this begins with having the courage to be self-compassionate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor West. Actually, I mean, really uh, profound words, uh, very inspiring. Uh, but also what I found uh, is, uh, you know, the ability to give uh, also some clear indication. I think that there was an agenda for uh, any manager, for human resource manager in our organizations, for sure, because uh, many different, uh, you know, suggestions came up, but in general, uh, I think uh, for all of us, uh, there is a really great food for thought. And now I would like to share with the audience uh, the pleasure to have Professor Ricciardi, uh, Lucy Nugent, uh, and Miklos uh, joining uh, us uh, in the stage. Thank you for being here. And I would like to start immediately with uh, Lucy Nugent, that is a CEO, but also is the chairperson of the European Association uh, of Healthcare Managers. And so I think it's very interesting now to, uh, to see, to hear which is the journey of a CEO in a hospital, also with uh, this scenario that has been depicted by Professor West. Thank you very much, Americo, and thank you to Sandra and George for the kind invitation. It has been a pleasure to be here over the past three days, and it's all about people. And my journey as a CEO started in 2019. I was appointed as CEO of Talley University Hospital, which is a large academic teaching hospital. It partners with Trinity College in Dublin. We have uh, 3,500 staff. Uh, we have a budget of almost 350 million. It was 239 when I started. Um, and we have staff from 63 different nationalities. We're a voluntary hospital, which means that we have, we're public, we're not for profit, but we are not owned by the state, we're funded by the state. But I have a board of directors who support me. So when I started out on this journey, um, I was the ninth CEO in 21 years. We were a, a merger of three hospitals, which were founded in 1753, 1829, 1839, and we're 25 years old on the 21st of June this year. So it had come through a period of the actual merger went very well, but it was under-resourced, 
um, when the new hospital was being designed, they cut 120 beds, so capacity was an issue. So my first job was to build uh, stability and trust uh, with the team. And by the team, I mean the whole hospital. So I spent the first nine months uh, meeting staff, having focus groups. The board of directors wanted a five-year strategic plan, and that was the easy part. We didn't have a vision statement. Uh, we had values on the back of our staff ID card, but when I asked somebody what are our values, they couldn't say them. So um, our vision statement uh, at this time is people caring for people to live better lives. And originally everyone thinks that applies to patients, but actually it applies to staff as well. We can't cure every patient, but we can maximize their quality of life. And we want every staff member who spends, I think, a third of your life in, in work to have a good experience. So we try and live those values, uh, that statement every day, and we have care values. So our care values are to collaborate, to achieve respect and equity. And I was very interested um, earlier discussions around sustainability and the environment. And respect means respect for our patients, each other, and the environment. And that came from staff. And it's my staff, particularly the younger staff, who are driving that agenda. So I don't think we'll have much resistance to that. But then to ensure that we were going to deliver on our, our vision mission, uh, our strategic goals are very simple. It's access, so it's all about improving access because the waiting times are too long. We do that through, we have a people strategy, we have a research and innovation strategy, we have a digital enablement strategy, uh, and integrated care. So again, very simple, but hopefully effective. Um, in relation to then, I suppose, building a culture, and it is really about that. It doesn't matter if I'm a good or a bad leader if the culture isn't appropriate. So we've actually joined the Health Service Executive Values in Action program, and it is basically nine behaviors that we would like to experience, for our patients to experience, and for each other to experience every day. And in relation to personal, we have to ask ourselves, am I putting myself in others' shoes? Uh, am I aware of the impact of my actions on others? And am I aware of my own stress? And then for my colleagues, um, am I acknowledging their work? Am I asking how I can help? And am I challenging toxic behaviors? For the patients, it's to use my name and their name. We have the Hello My Name uh, program which Katie Granger in the UK started. We commit to keeping people informed about what's happening to them now and next. And we do an extra kind thing. So I don't think anybody would disagree with those nine behaviors. So we have value in action champions. It's a peer-to-peer -peer process. We're still in early days. The COVID pandemic did cause a somewhat of a hiatus because I think we were, in the, certainly in the early days, surviving. Now we're hopefully thriving. Um, the patient's voice is very important to us. Uh, we don't believe in tokenism. So we have a patient representative on our board of directors. We have a patient community advisory council and they inform and co-design uh, different projects with us, which is very important as well. Our board of directors, every meeting starts with a patient story, and it's a complaint, and it's a compliment, because there is balance in both. So staff themselves, we do. We have a health and well-being program. We have yoga. We have mindfulness. We have an outdoor gym. Um, but we have a, a health and well-being officer. And while, again, quality is everyone's responsibility, so is health and well-being. But having a dedicated person driving initiatives, we feel, is very important. Um, we, uh, we do a lot in relation to our um, safer staffing, but again, it's really challenging. So part of our um, people strategy is to attract people to come and work with us. That's not easy. It's a very competitive market. So we, you, know, you, you can't really financially incentivize people in the public service. So we use social media, we use campaigns, but the greatest um, tool is word of mouth. So we get our own staff to you know, try, every time there's a new post, we ask them to share it amongst colleagues and friends. Twitter is on fire most of the time. It could almost be my full-time job. But that word of mouth is very strong. 
So when we've attracted you to come and work with us, we want to develop you. And by doing that, we have a Centre for Learning and Development. Around 350,000 a year goes into staff training. We run over 150 different programmes. We also sponsor four members of staff every year to do the Masters in Leadership that uh, Michael referred to. And what we're doing is actually creating highly employable, attractive people. So we have lost some people, um, but that's okay. Um, we're, they're, they're hopefully um, going out and talking well about the hospital and encouraging other people to come to us. Um, so again, retention is very important to us. Uh, we have recognition programs like our, our Heroes is going to be on next week, which is where the public patients peer-to-peer uh, -peer nominations for people that extol the values of the hospital. And then we have simpler things. We have an ice cream van every summer and we give people free ice cream. Often it's the little things that people enjoy most. Um, but what's most important, I suppose, is, as you said, we are not an island. Hospitals have been very guilty of being very siloed. So there's a new program in Ireland called Slauncher Care. It's a 10-year cross-political party agreed program for health, and integrated care is at its core. So we say that we're a hospital without walls, and um, we're still early in that journey. It is about actually asking how can we help. Um, some of our community colleagues, for example, don't have as well-developed digital platforms so why can't they share ours? Um, so again, it's changing that mindset. So COVID was challenging, but it also had positives. The agility, the team spirit. Um, I'll give you one small anecdote. My director of finance was put in charge of making sure we had PPE. And one day, uh, the delivery came. And at this stage, we were using about 3,500 gowns a day. And they came with eight, eight gowns. So um, that left us significantly short by 3,292. So he got into his car and drove three hours to another hospital that had ex you know, additional supply and drove back. So the next day, our staff were protected. And that's an example of someone going the extra mile. And I'm, I'm very proud of him. And he gets embarrassed every time I tell the story. Um, but we always say, um, people forget what you say they won't forget how you make them feel. And that's what we're trying to do. We, we're not perfect, I'm not perfect, but I suppose we're trying, and that's the most important message. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. With this journey, we were also able to understand, uh, you know, uh, lots of the solutions, uh, the, 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 the mechanisms, uh, uh, that you have used to transform uh, and to implement in, uh, in your work, in your organization. Uh, also, many of uh, the suggestions that are coming from uh, uh, what we have uh, heard from uh, uh, Professor West. So, thank you very much. And I would like to go to Professor Ricciardi. Professor Ricciardi, uh, allow me, uh, is a real leader at first. So, it's not talking only about leadership. Uh, he's uh, a leader, and actually, uh, with a huge uh, experience in promoting leadership uh, in medicine in this uh, country, and so is there a specificity uh, in Italy in uh, medical leadership? No, I think first of all, congratulations for the, the, the topic that you chose. Congratulations to Michael for a great presentation. I would like to offer a different uh, perspective from my public health point of view also about Italy, but in general about the globe, because it happens to me that during the pandemic I was the president of the World Federation of Public Health Association, and, oh, I, and I created a public health leadership coalition to take the pandemic, so I saw the different behavior around the world. And I think uh, with some concern that uh, after the pandemic, the world is going exactly in the opposite direction uh, that has been explained by Michael. Uh, and this is, of course, is a failure of the fundamental pillar of human development, of human uh, success. I don't know if you are aware of the book by Margaret Mead that uh, essentially explained why the Homo sapiens became the ruling species on, on planet Earth, because rather than leaving wounded members of the group alone to live uh, uh, and to die, uh, for instance, with a broken leg. Other animals uh, leave their colleagues alone to, to, to die. 
uh, the, the Homo sapiens started to take care and to create something which is going to compassionate helping other people to recover from the war and became the ruling species on planet Earth. Unfortunately, what I'm looking at is the world is going exactly in the opposite direction, at least for healthcare. Uh, what I mean is that Europe is a certain a better place for this, but it's, it's also paying a price to what has happened in this world is in turmoil. After 75 years, we don't have any more peace uh, on, on, on our continent, and that, of course, has serious implication also in the health sector. But just to give an example, I think that our compassionate leadership should be exercising not only within our organization, but in particular in these extraordinary challenging times, also beyond our organization. And in particular, when it comes to Europe, there are two uh, major pillars where we have built our prosperity in the past 70 year, 75 years, welfare and democracy that are seriously at risk. So we should be very much concerned about the fact that, that the European welfare system is, is vanishing because it was a system of transfer from rich to poor, from young to older, from employed to unemployed, from healthy to sick, and this is exactly what is disappearing. So. Um, I, I tell you from my observatory of the, being the chair of the Mission Board for Cancer of the European Commission, we had a high-level meeting in Geneva a couple of weeks ago with the world leaders uh, of their doctors, nurses, uh, cancer organization. And somehow I look with some concern of these professionals already very much focus on the business aspects of the, the management of healthcare, not on the spiritual, what I say, which is exactly at the basis of your talk, Michael. Um, when I speak with them, they essentially are concerned about the fact that, they, of course, they are few, they are burned out, they, in, depending of the country where they work, they are paid uh, too uh, few, but they do not feel compassionate to enough to save the welfare system, you know what I mean. And that's why I need a very strong relationship between we as a professional and managers, and in particular, a very good discussion between professionals and economists. In my experience, for instance, in the past three years, I've been advising the Minister of Health for uh, the pandemic, and I was the informal contact point with the Minister of Finance. For the pandemic, we didn't have any problem in funding the system. Money for vaccination, hospital, emergency care, that at a certain time, it stopped, you know, like a curtain, about the fact that, again, the economists, the financial people, watched again the healthcare services not as an investment, but as a cost, and not as a, a different kind of business, but as a business, you know, and that is something. And I wonder why economists and financial people, of course, there are exceptions, do not behave in a compassionate way when they are in charge. Because I've been working, for instance, with Prime Minister Mario Monti for many times. Now he's a public health professional. He is a chair of the Monti Commission on, 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 of WHO, and he understands. But in my experience, when Minister of Economic and Finances or Prime Minister were in charge, they didn't listen. You know, they just focused on their own business without the compassionate. And I close my... Uh, my consideration with another call to you as healthcare managers. I recently participated in an advisory board organized by one of the most important Australian uh, digital organization with the chief executive officers of some of the most important uh, hospitals in the world, literally from the five continents. And um, when I ask, uh, what are you doing for the planet? What are you doing for planetary health? You know, there is no possibility that we can have another planet. The planet will stay. It's us that are at risk. But you, managing hospital, managing healthcare, if you would be a country, you would be the 5% of the world pollution and what are you doing? And this chief executive officer say, honestly, nothing. We are doing nothing. Because essentially, what is healthcare sustainability in the challenge of the planetary health we have is something which we don't feel as our business. Uh, even if our organization work 365 days, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and we are some of the most important pollutants, 
That's not our business. I say, you must be wrong. You must think it because there is no health without planetary health, and there are no hospitals if you are flat, and there are some parts of the world which are becoming uninsurable. You know, there are parts of the world where there are hospitals, where there are healthcare organizations, which are going to die, we are going to close, we are going to shut down because of planetary health. So, not give for granted that this compassionate leadership is important only inside organization, but is important also for welfare, democracy, and planetary health. And I think that compassionate leadership that Michael described is the one that we really need for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Walter. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Fully agree. We need uh, a compassionate culture uh, for the society. And something is uh, also in, on the base of uh, the, uh, the work of uh, Michael West and many things that we have heard during uh, your uh, presentation goes in this direction. Um, Miklos, uh, what we need for educating future leaders? Uh, as a compassion leader. Yeah. So first of all, let me start with a confession. You know, I'm, I'm long in this profession uh, to, to, uh, to have seen many neologisms in, uh, in management. So when I, and then I only met the, the compassionate leadership um, term when I was preparing for this session. And you know, when, the, the more I, I worked with it, uh, the more I understood, and, and this is a very powerful and inclusive term, so I like it. Uh, so this is just a feedback. And then, you know, I'm, and then six quick points. The number one is that uh, the organization that I lead it grew out of the changes of the late 80s and early 90s. And you know, we, we did not turn to politics then because we said that the system and society will only change if organizations will be managed differently. So it's not an organizational dictatorship, but a compassionate holding environment for doing good. So that's, uh, and, and that's, that's the journey that we are taking. The, the second message, you know, in my life I had the opportunity to manage the Hungarian healthcare system for four years. I was sitting as a Minister of State for Health in a position where the average life expectancy is 20 months. And you know, the, you know at a certain level, complexity kicks in. And you have to recognize that simply three, see through the fog of complexity you cannot do alone. To, to gain control over complexity, you cannot do alone. To manage complexity for performance, you utterly cannot do alone. And your only chance, and that's the third message, uh, if, you can, if you have the ability to build up the internal commitment from the others, uh, in the others in the organization. And that's your only chance. If you just do it by your own hand, you are lost. Uh, and to build that up needs a lot of compassion. So, and, and in, in our school, we just, we, we really try to work on that. They, look, uh, you, you do not jump on it, but you first build up the conditions to be able to do that. And the, and the fourth message is change and adaptation. You know, the, the world order is shaken. And we are competing with economists where the cost of solidarity does not burden the cost of labor. And with our demography in Europe, yeah, this is a beautiful civilization achievement that we have these solidarity systems, but we are on the losing side. So to mobilize the group resources for that adaptation or challenge needs a lot of compassion on both sides. Uh, and and it, it cannot be a command line. Yeah. The, the fifth message is, um, is I think this compassionate leadership works on large scale. So if you do negotiations with professionals, agile, and, and if you see you care, and if you do co-creation exercises with patients uh, to, to, to make a patient pathway more efficient, they recognize you care. Uh, if you listen uh, and you include, they recognize you care, so compassion takes them on the trip, uh, and together you can do it. And, and they can even sacrifice a lot uh, well, I'm willing to travel to a regional cancer center instead of the local hospital if, if, I'm, if you make sure that I receive good care. So they, 
So they're willing to negotiate if, 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 they, if they see that compassion is there. And the sixth message is, um, is, might be a frightening message because my, my experience of present times and this post-pandemic times is that these organizational predators and organizational psychopaths prevail. Uh, so uh, it is a very difficult stuff uh, and it is a, it's a huge responsibility for system leaders, the higher their position is, to create a holding environment for, uh, for compassionate leadership. So I think all these management and leadership values that, that this nice collective terms, term describes, they are in danger uh, because, of the, because of the organizational predators and the valueless psychopaths. So that, that's a huge issue of these days. Great messages uh, that uh, we would like to share with the audience. And so we have some minutes, a few minutes, for collecting some uh, questions. Uh, I think that ooh, we have one on the back here and three there. We have just, here it is. Thank you. It's not a question, it's a deep appreciation for your courage and leadership in a world where hospitals have become corporations. And I do hope that we will each, despite being very excited about innovations and the future of medicine, etc., will take just a few messages from here to our own healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. We are going to collect uh, all the questions. Yeah, there was one there. Yeah, yes. And then. Thank you. I'm Sara Launia, representing European Junior Doctors. I hope maybe as well other, a little bit younger healthcare professionals. And as well, I would like to thank all of you also for the program planners to host this session. Uh, maybe just two uh, short remarks. Uh, firstly, even though I completely understand that in these times, it might seem like um, that maybe the younger people are stressed and focused on other things, but I would like to reassure you and maybe also us a tad younger ones that I think we still have values and we still chose healthcare for those values. And I think we will, you know, we will keep fighting for them. So, <laughs> but the other thing, I would dare EHMA to arrange that we will have the opportunity to participate in uh, compassionate leadership training. So, thank you. Thank you. One there, over, also in the back, yeah. And I, I, I don't know who would, would like to, actually, I would like to ask you. Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. My name is Steve Moore. I work in the uh, Saudi Arabian uh, healthcare system. My question is, how do you have this conversation with people who don't want to listen? If I was to go back, what's your one piece of advice? How do I, how do I go back and have this conversation? I'm known to be very tenacious and very persistent. And sometimes, um, you know, people can naturally be resistant of something, particularly if it means change for them. And it's, we do it all the time. You need to understand why. And once you understand why, then a conversation can happen. But um, I'm also known, we have a very long, it's called the hospital street. It's the spine of the hospital. And I will always leave about 10 minutes before I need to get to a meeting um, because I'll always nab the opportunity of catching somebody on that street and having an informal chat. But tenacity, I think, is what you have to do. Um, hi. 
Uh, Mbasim, um, I have uh, uh, many things actually I want to discuss, but maybe later, uh, but I will raise three points quickly. First is how to reconcile this work on compassionate leadership, not in a very big organization, but on the microsystem, for example, a clinic or a private actor or a startup, this is like us. Uh, a second question is about um, how this uh, concept also uh, work uh, when you have the practicalities of being an organization, like, for example, the point that the last speaker mentioned is that in reality, you have some leaders who try or are very compassionate or doing their best, but there are also competition within the organizations. And there are, for example, for us, we deal with investors, we deal with um, other competition. How can you balance the practicality of managing and leading an organization in a competitive setting with compassion. I don't see them as antagonistic, but I see them as very challenging. So I, I wish if uh, you can shed light on this. Um, I have other stuff, but thanks. <laughs> Thank you. We have many questions. <laughs> One there in the back, and then the colleague here. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm actually a health economist. So I have two questions. The first is for Professor West, and the second for uh, Professor Ligardi. Uh, so the first question about the NHS system, because I'm uh, currently part-time managing a health economics master program for University of South Wales, and uh, many of my colleagues there are, are working for the NHS. Uh, yes, so I would like to ask, for example, since about uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, Chancellor Jeremy Hunt was serving as uh, Secretary of Health in the UK. And he implemented uh, many reforms. And right now, it seems that he is still quite uh, confident about uh, the reform that he has implemented. But uh, uh, it is obvious that the uh, NHS staff uh, had different opinions with uh, you know, Chancellor Hunt. Uh, so, how do you think about uh, the effects of uh, Jeremy Hunt reform 10 years ago? And uh, how do you think how the NHS will uh, you know, tackle the challenges right now they are facing? And how do you think uh, economists, for example, Jeremy was uh, uh, from, with a business background, actually, not with health background. So, how do you think in future, uh, you know, the health economists could work with uh, clinicians? So, in your opinion, how do you think health economists could learn from the uh, you know, colleagues and professionals from medical background? Thank you very much. Uh, you had two final questions, and then I will ask uh, to the panel to answer, to the, not to the single point, but uh, to the all together, I mean. So yeah, one, yeah, one. There is the lady over there, the colleague. Then uh, not, not just a moment, we have uh, another Question, Evelyn? Hi, my name is Evelyn. Um, the question I have is, in recent months, we've seen a lot of healthcare workers going on strike, facing their dissatisfaction with their working conditions. And in response to that, sometimes we have seen politicians come out with very uncompassionate statements. So what advice would you give to the healthcare workforce for them to, to help them but remain motivated in the context of hearing those statements. Sorry, it's quite controversial. <laughs> May I ask? I'm from Ukraine, and I need to say that uh, compassionate leadership was those uh, power that ensured uh, survival of uh, healthcare system of Ukraine during the war. Not centralized system, but compassionate leadership from um, different sources, distributed network of volunteers, doctors and hospitals, uh, medical leaders, uh, different, different sources uh, which acted very separately, but with a uh, um, united aim. And uh, we have, uh, we have um, a very important um, internal discussion now how to, 
uh, how to save this impulse of uh, compassionate leadership in peacetime, not in the condition of external threat, but how can we centralize it, how can we make it like a system, not like a will of people. And uh, I hope I will find some uh, useful insights here, and thank you very much for, for this event and for your discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a final question here in the front. Thank you very much for your insightful commentary. Uh, I, I believe in compassionate leadership because I think it complements great interpersonal skills for a leader. And as we move rapidly to AI and all the technologies, I believe the next trajectory would be the compassionate leadership for those who have to, because I do not think in my time machines would be able to show compassion. But how about also the important part of compassionate followership? and not just compassionate leadership. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I would ask to the, the panel to give a final remark, and the final, final remark will be uh, Professor West, who would like to intervene. You know, of inputs from uh, from you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if you do not mind, I react on the on the on the nurses demonstration on the on the working conditions. You know, there was um, in Hungary there were some edgy situations some months ago, and uh, and uh, and we were debating in the class, and and we improvised a, a, a political gaming in the classroom. And, you know, the the end result of the modeling in the classroom. Uh, was the exact same what happened later in, in reality, and this was an escalation. So I think, uh, I think uh, the compassionate leadership, the meaning of compassionate leadership could also be used for de-escalation. Uh, and I think, uh, but it, of course, uh, the politicians are, and many times it is, yeah, they, yeah it is, there's this, this political translation of everything is, 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 can be very toxic. But, but I think compassionate leadership approaches can, uh, can be used for de-escalation of, uh, of this radicalization of conflicts. Uh, well, I suppose just to say that um, I agree with our colleague from Ukraine. Um, it's very, it's, the challenge is to maintain compassionate leadership when we're not in times of crisis. So during the pandemic, it was easy. There was a common purpose worldwide. And it's when things return to somewhat normal. How do you maintain that cross-sectorial working, no boundaries, um, ensuring the welfare of your staff? Because for me, as, as a CEO, it was always you know the patient first, staff very close second. Now they're very much after what I've seen and been so proud to witness. They're, they're obviously on a par now. But it is, how do we maintain that focus? Because it, it doesn't take extra effort, like Michael says. It's just to constantly keep it to the forefront and to remind each other. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I, I was told when I became a CEO, be careful of the shadow you cast. And that means in, in the times of sunshine, you're providing protection and shade. But equally speaking, you could be hindering somebody. So it, it's, I think to, to hold each other to account is a very powerful thing. Um, um, the, the world will be saved by cynical, skeptical, or by compassionate leaders and followers. I mean, the answer is, is easy. The problem is the mechanics of implementation. How these compassionate leaders and followers uh, work together to save literally the world. And I'm very optimistic about the intergenerational alliance. I look at the young people. We had the World Conference on Public Health uh, last month in Rome, 3,000 people from all over the world, more than 1,500 young professionals. They were enthusiastic, such as the young daughters uh, uh, being here in, in the room. The problem is how can we help them to overcome the barrier of a world that rather than having homo sapiens, is much crowded of sharks. 
and sharks eat each other, not take care of each other. And essentially, it's what's happening with a, a, a minority of the population becoming richer and richer and richer, and 90% and, and of the population becoming poorer, poorer, and poorer. So the mechanism of implementation means that at different levels, political level, managerial level, professional level, citizens level, patients level, industry level, and media level, we work together. It's not easy, but the mission-oriented approach that we are taking in Europe is the right response. I can announce that on July the 4th, President von der Leyen is, is announcing the confirmation of the five missions, even the, there, is, there will be a sixth mission, and the challenges of the world, which is climate change, water, food and agriculture, cities, human health, connect and cancer health, are going to be confirmed. In this way, a mission-oriented approach means an ambitious target, a lot of funding, not only financial, but a lot of human resources, managed together in a way that we can innovate the way in which even in a highly bureaucratic environment, such as the European Commission, we deliver. And we are delivering. I mean, yesterday I, I, I met with the other colleagues. We have produced in the last three years more than in the past 20 years in this domain. And there are leading to concrete results. Put the Green Deal, put the decision that we are taking on planetary health, put the decision that we are taking in the cancer field. So I'm concerned, optimistic, but it's the mechanics of implementation that now we have to take care. And I think that organizations such as the European Health Management Association is particularly important. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to fund all the channels, all the networks, all the activities that are already in place, adding values and taking advantage of the experience we had in the past. We have five years up to 2030 for all these challenges. We, we are not talking about tw the next 20 years. Because if we don't deliver in the next five years, we are in serious troubles in all the challenges that we are taking. So looking at the young, please don't feel depressed, feel excited <laughs> to be in this particularly historic environment. And please ignore, uh, I advise you to read a Bible book for change making, which is literally by John Cotter, our iceberg is melting and essentially is what is happening literally. When Cotter wrote the book, there was an hypothesis. Now it's literally doing. And you are living on this iceberg. You will be living in this iceberg. So if you don't do that, together maybe with some compassionate senior leaders, you are going to be in trouble. Okay. Walter, Professor West, your final remarks. So we're capable as human beings of doing terrible things to each other and to the planet. And uh, rather simplistically, we can think of our, our having three emotional regulation systems. One is threat-based, and we respond with aggression or flight. Another is resource acquisition. We want to get what we want. And another is nurturing or compassion. And these emotional regulation systems, I think, are clearly out of balance. The way that our media has developed over the last hundred years, we see threat all of the time, and it evokes that threat regulation system, which causes us to behave aggressively, competitively. And our resource acquisition system has led to a kind of greed, and we are destroying the planet. I always think that every product we buy is made out of the planet. And the more products we buy and create, the more we're taking from the planet. So we have to rebalance our emotional regulation systems and create a commitment, as, as you say, a social movement to create compassion at every level of our society and in every, every domain. I think that you know, the idea of compassionate leadership training for junior doctors and all healthcare workers is fantastic. I've been working with Wales and developing a compassionate leadership program, and they're eager to share it free with everybody around the world, including Emma. When we want to bring about change, if we try to do that alone in our organizations or in our society, we often just get chewed up and spat out. We're like a virus. We have to work together in social movements, collectively, across all domains of human activity. And I think to answer your question about how we achieve that change, it is, I think, about persistence, that courage to keep going, to work collectively 
and to use the evidence. I mean, all of the evidence we have from that huge database that I described tells us what predicts the performance of healthcare organizations, staff engagement, compassionate leadership, team working, low levels of discrimination, high levels of equality, low levels of burnout, low levels of chronic excessive workload. This is what the evidence tells us, and economists, by the way, will react to that. So we have to work collectively and courageously in every area. I'm part of a, an organization called the Global Compassion Coalition, which is seeking to achieve exactly that in all domains of society. And one part of that is compassion in politics. So we have a group in the UK now, uh, Compassion in Westminster, to try to bring about change in the way politicians behave, who are currently setting a terrible example for young people and for our society. But in the end, I think, compassion begins with me. It begins with how, how I have the presence to be self-compassionate, recognizing that I'm as, as deserving of love as every other human being in the planet. This is not some narcissistic self-indulgence. It's recognizing that I, if I have the courage to connect authentically with myself and to care for myself, then I can connect more authentically and deeply and caringly with all of those I interact with. So I think it's action as individuals in how we first and foremost behave towards ourselves and then active activity collectively in social movements to transform human society. And, and the last thing I would say, Americo, is this is about connection. Compassion is about connecting with each other connecting with ourselves. And it's also about compassion, not only in healthcare, but in the whole ecosystem of which we're a part. We're interconnected, we're a part of all of that. We're interconnected with our planet, we're a part of all of that. Compassion for our planet is fundamental over the next five years to our ability to respond to these challenges, as you say. I would like to... I really thank uh, Professor West and all of you, and uh, I would like to repeat this big applause for uh, this final uh, uh, plenary session that uh, was very inspiring, thanks to you. Thank you very much. Now we're moving immediately to the, uh, to the closing ceremony. Oh.